Good morning. Welcome everyone this morning to the Oshkosh Chamber and Navon Breeson, uh, one of our breakfast briefings. So excited to have everyone joining us this morning. Looks like uh, Oshkosh is uh, not destined for any snow anytime soon. So that gives us an opportunity to relax, have a cup of coffee this morning and get enlightened on protecting our intellectual property for your business. Um, I wanna point out just some logistical things that number one, we are recording this. So if later on you would like to share this with other people within your organization, that is certainly possible. Um, you'll be sent a link. And then in addition, it will also go on the Ashkosh Chamber site in our archives of our webinars. The chat function will remain open um, the entire time. And you can find that on the bottom of your screen by scrolling over the top of it. And with that, I would now like to introduce John Iden from Von Briesen. And he is going to lead us this morning um, as we begin this very informationally rich seminar. Thank you, John. Thank you, good morning, everyone. Happy to, to be with the group again. As you know, Von Briesen is a, a great partner of the chamber and, and vice versa, the, the chamber a great partner of the firm. And these presentations are typically HR focused and in 2020 and they've been COVID focused and you can rest assured that we'll be back with uh, more COVID-19 programming in early 2021 to talk about where we're at with vaccines and EEOC guidance and updated uh, federal relief packages and if the state legislature is ever going to come back to work this in this uh, global pandemic, all of that will be on the agenda for 2021. But we thought we'd give everyone a little COVID break, but also more importantly, showcase some of the other practice areas that Von Breesen has to offer. As you probably know from hearing Jim and I talk, we're part of a, a large firm here, 200 plus attorneys, offices all around the state, and most recently added offices in Chicago. That's where my colleagues this morning are sitting. John O'Rednick and Jack Fosnock are two IT attorneys, as I said, in our Chicago office. And intellectual property laws, they're going to explain, um, is, is pre pretty complicated and more importantly, not an area of law that you want to dabble in. It's, it's something when you have a piece of intellectual property that's worth protecting, there's significant advantages to doing it right and, and significant disadvantages or problems that can come about if you don't properly follow the steps and, and you lose that protection. And we're fortunate enough here at Von Breesen to have two highly, highly decorated engineers by, by trade before they came to the dark side and became attorneys, but very knowledgeable guys. They're gonna to put together, they have put together a great presentation. And this is gonna be kind of an issue spotting, high level overview. And if you have follow-up questions or fact specific questions about intellectual property, that you're dealing with in your workplace, please feel free to follow up with them. Their contact information is at the end. So with that, I'm going to, to drop off the video. I'm, I'm looking forward to listening in. And uh, John, take it away. Well, thank you very much, John, for the introduction. Um, so briefly, uh, I'll let uh, my colleague Jack uh, do a little introduction to himself after he unmutes himself. Okay, thank you, John. Um, I think the reason I'm introduced first is not because I originated this uh, uh, seminar this morning, my colleague did, but because I'm the old guy of the two of us. Uh, as, my, as the slide says here, I've been practicing intellectual property law and I've been doing it for a long time. My practice is very broad based. I work in the patent area, the trademark area, the copyright area, the trade uh, secret area. Um, as as, as uh, the slide indicates, I was born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio, so I'm an unfortunate Cincinnati Reds fan. Went to school in St. Louis. Uh, then I worked for eight years in the uh, petroleum industry, and ever since then, and it's been a long time, I've been practicing intellectual property. So uh, that's my introduction. Thank you, John. No problem, Jack. Um, so. I uh, studied mechanical engineering at Purdue, uh, but then a lot of my work experience comes from my time in the Navy where I was driving submarines around. And, uh, and then after uh, about 10 years in the Navy, I used the GI Bill to go to law school at night while working as a sales engineer in the day. I've been doing patent prosecution primarily 
for the past uh, five years. Um, so today we're going to talk about the new IP section that John was mentioning. Um, the four different broad areas of intellectual property and how to protect those IP that you have, as well as at the end, we'll give a high level overview of some of the recent and upcoming changes as if, if it's been a while since you've uh, plugged yourself into what was happening in intellectual property law. And then throughout, uh, I do have a trivia question. And so if, uh, when that comes up, uh, do answer in the chat. We do have a special prize from one of the chamber uh, participants. But uh, overall, um, the intellectual property group at Von Briesen, uh, as of before November 1st, we used to be the law firm of Miller, Mathias and Hull, which was a boutique intellectual property firm for the past 15 years in Chicago. Uh, we have over 20 attorneys, agents, staff, and illustrator in our Chicago office. And uh, we merged with Von Briesen and Roper uh, this past month. Uh, throughout our practice, we do all types of intellectual property protections. Um, and just for a sampling, last year we did over 360 patent applications filed, uh, and then we, it's a, it's a long process to get a patent, but uh, we also got 300 granted patents, and those would have been filed in the, in the previous few years. Um, and then we also do a, a decent amount of trademark registrations, uh, both a, a getting them on the front end and then maintaining them throughout the course of their life. Uh, the group works with uh, many Fortune 500 companies, uh, small businesses that have a couple uh, patents in their portfolio, and also uh, solo inventors and startups. So we uh, run a, a large, broad, we have a very broad uh, client base that uh, we can help pretty much anybody out protecting their intellectual property. So one of the First ones that we're going to talk about is a patent, and I have a picture of not my submarine, but a, a previous submarine over there on the right. Um, but this is a, uh, a time limited monopoly that is granted by the Constitution that we can do this. Uh, it and it's, this is so for the sole purpose of encouraging innovations. And this, when you come up with an invention it's, and you then file and get a patent on it, you can stop somebody for. Uh, using, selling, importing, uh, and pra basically practicing your invention in any jurisdiction that you have a patent on. But the trade-off there is you have to do full upfront public disclosure of your invention. So that way, after your patent period elapses, it then becomes part of uh, the general knowledge that everybody can use. So a lot of what we do as patent practitioners is uh, draft your claims on your patent, which gives you your legal protection, but then adequately enable that invention. So we are do, carrying up our end of the bargain of teaching uh, the rest of the population how we use our inventions. And I'll let Jack talk a little bit about the trademark law. And trademarks is what we consider the second of the three major branches of intellectual property. Those three branches, again, being patents, trademarks, and copyrights with trade secrets being kind of a lesser fourth branch. And in the tra on the trademark side, when you think of a trademark, think of a brand. Those are synonymous terms, trademarks, brands. Uh, and trademarks, as, uh, as uh, indicated on the slide, distinguish uh, a source for the goods and services provided to a customer. A customer sees the uh, trademark Coca-Cola. Uh, they understand that that product uh, either originates or is somehow affiliated with the Coca-Cola company and nobody else. So it allows customers to assume that a product has a certain quality based on its source. And uh, the important point here is that trademarks are not, uh, do not exist uh, by themselves. Except they only exist in connection with the products that they're used for. For example, my uh, John, my uh, fellow presenter here, put up a nice trademark on the right side showing Lambeau Field. That is actually a registered trademark. I looked it up, John, and it was registered in 2005. And you might think that that trademark was uh, registered for, say, uh, football players or football games. And it was, but it's also registered for things like greeting cards, paper towels, beer steins, bathing suits, etc. So... Uh, so uh, if you've seen that trademark, 
in other places in retail stores on those kinds of goods, uh, now you know why. Uh, trademarks can be simple words. They can be phrases, logos. They can be symbols without any text. Or in the case of the uh, trademark on the screen, they can be a combination of words and designs. Uh, finally, it's important to know that uh, trademarks cannot be registered until you, the applicant, are actually using the trademark in commerce, and you can prove that with evidence that you provide the trademark office. Uh, go ahead, John. And going on to the third uh, type of trademark or intellectual property protection, we do have copyrights, and this is to protect the original works of authorship uh, once you fix them into the tangible medium. And so uh, at the bottom, you'll see we do have our first, our trivia question. And so if you want to log into the chat, if you are familiar with the artist of this painting, um, at the end, we'll uh, tell you why we included this particular piece of art. But um, the patents and the trademarks are examined rights. So when you, uh, you have to prepare an application, submit it with the patent and trademark office, and those get examined by an examiner and just to make sure we meet all the legal requirements. With copyrights, you have that right from the time it is uh, fixed into a medium. So as soon as you write that something down, uh, that is a copyrighted piece of art. We'll go into a little bit more about registration, registering these copyrights um, later on, but this is uh, copyright protection is just for works of uh, original works of art. Mm -hmm. And then we also have trade secrets. Um, recently, this is uh, starting to become more uniform federally, but uh, trade secret law is largely a state law issue. So there are a lot of different ways to protect your trade secrets, and it depends on the jurisdiction that you are in. But in general, uh, a trade secret is something that's not known, is valuable to others, and is also um, reasonably protected to maintain its secrecy. And some examples include like a recipe, uh, how you make something, um, your code, a lot of different uh, ways to uh, have trade secrets. They can be similar to patents, but we'll discuss some of the differences later on. So if you think you have an invention, uh, why should you protect it? Well, first off, what are inventions? Uh, they're something that are an improvement to a product that is new or non-obvious. Um, and the three broad categories are utility patents. Uh, those are the, uh, ideas, objects, processes that uh, do things. Uh, a design patent is on the looks of a feature and a plant patent is just that on a uh, actual plant and, um, that you produce by growing and splicing. Um, so you, a lot of the I, patents that I work on are very small improvements to existing models. So a mirror on a truck, um, you come up with the different motors and controls for how to reposition the mirror. And you have a unique configuration that gives you an edge over your competitors. Um, or you have a, a different uh, online ordering system and the way your computer references different lookup tables, uh, you can, if you think that that is new and people aren't doing it, you can apply and for and hopefully obtain a patent. And that gives you a lot of different rights. Uh, mainly the primary purpose is that you can stop a competitor from doing your invention. Um, but you can also build an overall portfolio. So if you hope to one day be acquired, uh, or you can then uh, list those as assets that you have to your company and those do uh, improve the value of your company. Uh, but also just by having a big portfolio, uh, you might stay off any patent litigation from a competitor because on the off chance you may be infringing uh, uh, one of their patents. Well, if you have 100 patents, they likely might be infringing one of yours. And so it's uh, sort of the, like the new nuclear war, mutually assured destruction. If you both have large patent portfolios, uh, you just sort of stay clear of each other. Um, but also they can be used in marketing and you can see that a lot in patent pending or uh, like the patented designs where you put your patent number on there. Um, a lot of people in commerce 
might not fully understand that what a patent entails, um, but it just means that it was new and it, it, you got an examined right. It doesn't necessarily mean that you were, you're better than somebody else. Uh, you're just newer than somebody else in the way that you're doing it. And a lot of people can see patented uh, as a very uh, useful marketing tool. Um, so when you do have an invention, uh, there's a couple ways to think about how you want to protect it if you want to get a patent. Uh, some of our larger clients uh, have a lot of in-house counsels and they're very on top of their, the field of inventions. And so they, they know when they invented something. But if you're um, just starting off in the patent process and you're, you're not on the cutting edge of your field of technology, but you think you got something, we often recommend a, a prior art search to start off. And that can um, get a lay of the land of what has already been invented and see if you want to further invest money uh, to obtain the rest of the patent. Um, we do have provisional and non-provisional filings, uh, which can get you the patent pending and the patent process started uh, cheaper if you go the provisional route, uh, vice the non-provisional route, which is the full route to go get the, your examined patent. Um, but mainly uh, this next slide or the next bullet point where the claims determine the scope of your invention, that's really where having a good a uh, solid understanding of your invention and working with a patent professional can help you out. Uh, you really want the right scope of claims. Uh, you can basically get a, an invention on almost anything if you narrow your claims enough, but at the end of the day, it might not be a very valuable patent because it, it has no ability to stop somebody from doing something if your claims are, are too narrow. So you uh, really need to understand what is happening in your claims. There's both uh, technical and legal uh, meanings to words and having a good patent practitioner can help make sure that you get the right claims on your invention. Uh, we talked about the duty to enable. Uh, that's where most of the words come from in a patent application, but uh, they're almost secondary to the claims, but they definitely need to be there to support what you are claiming. Uh, the United States is now a first to file country that uh, changed in the past decade. We used to be a first to invent country. We were one of the only countries in the world that had that system. Now it's uh, when you get something on file with the patent office. And once you do get your application on file with the patent office, there are various ways to speed it up, uh, always with paying fees to the patent office. But you can uh, expect to wait about a year and a half before the examiner even picks up your application. And then it's like a little tennis match back and forth between the office and uh, you or your attorney that's representing you where they examine it, come up with reasons why you shouldn't get a patent and you have to rebut those reasons uh, in various briefs all within a certain period of time. And that can go on indefinitely. Um, but generally about 18, 12 to 18 months, uh, the examination process ends and you either have or you have a patent or you've given up uh, trying to get a patent. And then once you do have uh, the patent, it issues out and uh, you're able to maybe file more continue, continuation applications uh, before it fully issues. And then you have maintenance fees on the backside uh, to keep the patent up. Uh, once you do have your patent, you can work on licensing. Uh, so if you don't intend to make your product or if a uh, competitor is doing your invention, uh, you can try to license your patent to them and uh, an attorney can work with you to make up a licensing agreement. Or you, if you want, you can try to stop them from practicing your patent and your invention uh, by uh, suing in federal court. Um, Mentioned earlier, we also have patent pending, and then you can also mark your patent or mark your invention with your patent number to uh, just put people on notice and sort of advertise that you do have a new product to your consumers. Um, and at the very bottom, I put some of the remedies, but uh, the largest patent case uh, was issued in uh, patent damage award was rewarded in 2016 of $2.5 billion for a pharmaceuticals patent. Um, but that unfortunately was overturned on an appeal. They found that the uh, patent sh should not have been granted in the first place because it was not, uh, it was obvious over what the prior art was. So um, 
PricewaterhouseCoopers did do a study and uh, their two 2017 results showed that the median damages were $10.2 million. Um, so there definitely is some advantages available if you have the wherewithal to go through the litigation uh, to see your damages on the backside. Okay, uh, John just gave you uh, an overview of patent law and uh, the patent application process, and he gave you an, an indication that it can take a while. I have to tell my clients to be a little patient because once we file a patent application, as John said, it can take 18 months and often a little bit longer before we hear back from the patent office with what's called an office action or a letter, if you will, indicating whether or not the patent office thinks we have something that's patentable. Um, and then we can continue the process from there. As John said, we call that patent prosecution, where we can respond to that office action with arguments or amendments to our claims in order to get our clients the best patent possible. And I would say these days, uh, John, the average pendency the average pendency of a patent application from filing to the issuance of the patent is around three years. Would you agree? That sounds about right, yes. Yeah, so again, I have to counsel my clients to be a little patient. Uh, the, the, the fastest I've gotten a patent is, uh, I've gotten patents in less than a year, but that's very unusual. Now I'm gonna spend uh, a little time talking about trademarks, uh, the next three slides will be devoted to trademarks, and then John will uh, continue with copyrights. So how do you get a trademark? I'm going to rephrase this question this way. Uh, how, do you get, how do you acquire trademark rights? Trademark rights begin in one of two ways, either by using your trademark, just simply creating your product and putting the trademark out there and offering to sell or selling the product, getting it into retail stores, whatever, just putting the trademark out there, uh, that establishes some rights merely by using the trademark in commerce. The second way to get trademark rights is to file what's called an intent to use application with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. We've got a typo on our screen, I apologize. That's the United States, the USPTO. So again, you can either, uh, your trademark rights start either by the first day you use it or the day you file your intent to use patent application. So that's an important point that when you file a trademark application to try to register your mark, there are two kinds of applications. The intent to use application, which I just mentioned, where you've thought of the trademark, but... Uh, but you haven't started using it uh, on a product yet, and that's very common, or you've actually started to use your trademark. Uh, that's called a use application. So uh, we recommend registering a trademark with the uh, United States Patent and Trademark Office, but when you do, you can, you'll file either a use application, and with that use application, you'll actually submit evidence of use, like a, like a photograph of the product or a photograph of the trademark on the product or on the product packaging or that intent to use or ITU application. Now, can you do the application process yourself? You can. Um, very few people do because it can get surprisingly complicated, uh, even, even the application itself. If you go to the USPTO website, which is www uspto.gov, you'll see a, a button for trademarks and forms will, if you follow through, you can see the application form and attempt to fill it out yourself. And from time to time, people do that. But, uh, uh, but it can get complicated real fast. I've had clients who will file an application and then when they get an office action, just like on the patent side, we also get feedback from the USPTO on the trademark side. It's also called an office action. And that first office action on the trade, in trademark applications often raises a lot of objections to the original application, which I then help my clients with. Uh, but often, if, 
if you have a trademark attorney file your application for you, you can avoid that office action and go right to the what we call the notice of allowance. Uh, so, uh, so again, it can actually save you money to uh, hire, a, hire a trademark attorney up front to file your application. Trademark applications are a lot less expensive than patent applications. Um, a rough ballpark for a trademark application, a, a pretty straightforward trademark application is, uh, depending on the trademark and the number of products, the number of goods and the the, the number amount of goods and services associated with that trademark, the approximate cost can be anywhere from a low of six hundred dollars to file to maybe a thousand dollars or more. Again, depending on the number of products. So that's. We consider that relatively inexpensive, at least compared to patents. Um, uh, trademark attorneys can help you select the appropriate filing basis. Uh, there are more filing basis than, than the two I've mentioned before, uh, intent to use and use. Sometimes trademark applications are filed on the basis of, of pending trademark applications in foreign countries. So we file, I file trademark applications for European clients. Uh, who have already filed abroad, and now they want trademark protection in the United States. This may be a good point for me to interject uh, the uh, a point of law regarding trademarks, which I think applies basically to patents too. Both patents and trademark law uh, protection kind of stop at the border. So your trademark, your United States trademark, even if you get it registered, your trademark protection stops at the border. So if you're selling your product abroad, uh, uh, there are good reasons to get uh, trademark protection abroad as well, and I'll talk about that in a moment. The trademark attorney can also help you identify the trademark classifications. If you have a lot of products, your trademark application uh, is likely to, like Lambeau Field with swimming suits and footballs and things of that nature, your trademark application is likely to cover multiple classifications, and you can figure about $250 to $300 per class as a filing fee that helps the government run. Uh, finally, trademark attorneys can advise you on the scope of your trademark rights. Um, uh, uh, I won't get into a lot of detail on that now, except to repeat that your trademark rights pretty much stop at the border, although you can, with a registered trademark, you can prevent the importation of what they call gray market goods, which bear your trademark, but have nothing to do with you. Uh, next slide. So understanding your trademark. Federal registration provides significant advantages over common law trademark rights. When I said a moment ago that there are two ways to acquire trademark rights, and one of those ways is to use it in commerce, uh, Use in commerce is what initiates what we call common law trademark rights, trademark rights that just exist by virtue of use. Uh, common law trademark rights will likely give you priority over a later user of the same trademark, should that happen, who, say, files a trademark application before you. Um, if you if you can prove that you're, you've actually used your trademark in commerce before that person who went to the USPTO and filed that trademark application, even though you have not, uh, you can probably prevail in that situation and either prevent them from getting their registration, or even after they've got their registration, uh, there are ways you can cancel, you can petition the uh, trademark office to cancel their registration on the grounds that you used yours first. So although common law rights aren't as good as uh, getting an actual federal registration, uh, uh, they, can be, they can be powerful in the way I just mentioned. Uh, federally registered trademarks are designated with the familiar Circle R designation. Um, as, as you know, you see the Circle R on products a lot. You also see that TN designation on products. Uh, the TM designation really doesn't have much legal significance. It simply means that the maker of that product or the distributor of that product 
is claiming rights in that brand, in that trademark. It doesn't necessarily mean they have any trademark rights, but they're notifying the world by that TM designation that they believe they have rights in that trademark, that brand. And I certainly recommend to my clients, if they're selling product, branded product, that they go ahead and put that trademark symbol on there immediately uh, so that so that it does notify the world that that's your trademark. But at the same time, I often recommend that they consider uh, applying to uh, register the trademark uh, so that they can get the Circle R and all the benefits that that entails. I've already covered the uh, two basic types of trademark applications, use in commerce or ITU applications. Um, regarding international protection, I've already mentioned that a U.S. registered trademark pretty much only applies to products uh, sold or offered for sale within the United States. So as soon as you anticipate selling product abroad, it's a good idea to, uh, uh, to file applications abroad. And here's a difference between U.S. law and most uh, foreign trademark laws in that um, in the U.S., as I mentioned, uh, trademark, we do have a common law trademark right that begins with use. Uh, many foreign jurisdictions do not have that common law trademark rights with, right with use. Your trademark rights in a lot of foreign countries begin only with registration. Uh, that's a particular bugaboo for famous brands like Coca-Cola and Nike, et cetera, uh, where third parties register those same trademarks in foreign jurisdictions, uh, even though they have nothing to do with Coca-Cola and Nike, just to try to blackmail Coca-Cola and Nike into buying those registrations. Uh, foreign countries are catching on to that scam and are creating laws that discourage that, but it still goes on a little bit. Bottom line, if you believe you're going to be selling in Japan or Europe, it's a good idea to file a trademark application as soon as possible in those jurisdictions. Uh, the USPTO examination for uh, trademarks is a little simpler than patents, but as I said uh, before, uh, sometimes there are some sticky points involved uh, if you don't file the trademark application exactly properly, and sometimes even if you do, the trademark office uh, might uh, initially reject the application based on what we call likelihood of confusion in the sense that your trademark is too similar to somebody else's who's also using it with similar products. Uh, those are the kinds of issues that uh, trademark attorneys like myself uh, help clients with. Uh, trademarks generally go through the system a lot faster than patents, uh, whereas a patent can take three years or more, sometimes less. Trademarks typically go through the system in about a year. So roughly, uh, if you file a trademark application and all goes well, you can figure to get your registration within a, uh, in about a year's time. Uh, next slide. And just real, before we go to the next slide, Jack, you're, uh, you reminded me of a story of my local community where uh, for the past 20 years, we've had the Olympic Indoor Swimming Center as one of the facilities in our park district. It got kind of old and they announced uh, we, via a press release that they were gonna remodel the Olympic Indoor Swimming Center. Well, the attorney for the associated with the Olympics sent our park district a letter saying, well, you don't have anything to do with the Olympics. You just have an Olympic sized swimming pool. And so our park district had to come up with a new name for that. Um, so even though for the past 20 years, that pool and park district had a brand in our community, they ended up having to change it uh, in the midst of their reconstruction uh, because somebody got tipped off to it via the press release. So if you are engaging in business underneath what you think is your trademark, you might inadvertently be infringing upon somebody else's trademark rights and you might get a letter from them. And if you've already invested in your brand, uh, it's, it could be a costly proposition to, to shift your brand. Thankfully uh, for our park district, it came at a, a good opportune time. We're completely remodeling, let's give it a new name anyway. But if that was your business and you needed to uh, completely change the name of your business uh, 20 years in because you got a letter from somebody else and you just don't have the rights over them, that could uh, be devastating. Thanks, John. I'll give you another sports-related example, and then I'll move on to my last of my three trademark slides. I had a client back when, uh, in one of the World Cup years, World Cup soccer, um, where Chicago was hosting one of the 
rounds in the World Cup. And my client came out with uh, soccer balls and some other paraphernalia, and they put the phrase World Cup on those soccer balls and the flags and the T-shirts, which I think they were just selling on street corners here in Chicago and perhaps elsewhere. And believe it or not, I think World Cup turned out to be a registered trademark of the International Soccer Federation, which caused a big headache. So sometimes you think a mark is available and uh, when it's not. Uh, so that brings me to the last slide, and uh, which is labeled protecting your mark. Uh, the first thing I recommend to clients, and one of the things trademark attorneys can do for you, is to let you know if the trademark that you've thought of but haven't started using whether it's available or not. We do that, we call that trademark availability searches. I strongly recommend to my clients that we do that. It, it generally doesn't cost that much. Uh, sometimes a trademark availability search can be $300 or less, again, depending on the complexities of the trademark and how many countries you want searched, whether it's just the United States or North America or the world, but still it's a very good idea to uh, ask a trademark attorney uh, whether your trademark is available. Uh, that's getting a little easier for everyone to do because of Google. And indeed, I do use Google as one of my trademark sources, although I also use various trademark databases like the United States Patent and Trademark Office database to check out the availability of marks. So the first step in protecting your mark is to pick a good mark that no one else has. Um, uh, maintenance documents, uh, this, is, this is an important point that contrasts trademark law to patent law. A trademark and a trademark registration can last indefinitely if you continue to use it and you maintain the mark. Uh, patents, as John said, have a, a limited monopoly, and that limited monopoly we like to say is 20 years, but that 20 years uh, begins the date you file your patent application. So if it takes three years to get a patent uh, issued, uh, then, then you've got 17 more years from the date of your patent issuance. By contrast, uh, you file a trademark application today, uh, you get your registration in late 2021, you can keep that trademark registration for decades and decades as long as you want, and there are some very old registered trademarks in the United States, as long as you continue to use them and you file uh, and pay for trademark renewals every 10 years. Policing and enforcing your trademark rights. Again, keeping your mark, uh, as we just said, means using your mark. And, uh, and by the way, uh, when clients, if I clear a mark, we do our trademark availability search, I tell them, in my best opinion, your trademark is available for your use in these countries and in connection with the products uh, you want to use the trademark for, then I encourage my clients, start using the mark, even though we haven't even filed a trademark application yet, although frequently we, we do file that intent to use application. But even while the trademark application is pending, use the mark, get it out there. That's, it's your business, your job is to uh, sell goods and services, make money, um, and so I want to help you do that. And, uh, and again, start putting the TM symbol uh, next to your trademark uh, wherever you use it. Uh, if you use it in marketing materials, not only do I encourage using the TM symbol wherever possible, you don't have to use it every time. And again, you don't even have to use the TM symbol. But I strongly recommend with uh, clients that if they have marketing materials, whether online or printed materials, that they somehow if the trademark is embedded in other text, they somehow set that trademark off uh, uh, from the rest of the text in boldface, in specialized uh, typeface, or with the TM designation, uh, just to uh, you know get customers used to knowing about your brand. Um, the likelihood of confusion issue is kind of addressed two, at two points. One, when we clear the trademark. Uh, when a client asks me if a trademark is available, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm searching the trademark databases, including common law. That's what the Google search does. I'm simply searching for trademarks that companies are using in commerce 
but they haven't filed any applications anywhere. So they don't appear in any trademark database, such as the USPTO database, but they're out there on Google. So I have to do that Google search, which is what I call a common law search, and I'm trying to determine whether uh, my client's proposed trademark is likely to cause confusion with any existing trademarks. Hopefully the answer is no, the client can use the mark, and we can get it registered. The second way likelihood of confusion crops up as an issue is, uh, again, once you've started using your mark, uh, either a client comes to me and says, somebody else is using my mark, uh, Jack, what can I do about it? And I determine, and I conduct a likelihood of confusion analysis, and then I advise the client accordingly. Or clients come to me and say, I've got this letter from somebody who's accusing me of trademark infringement, and, and they tell me they have this registered trademark. I do the same analysis, so it's, I try to be as objective as possible to give my client the best advice possible, and I let them know how we can proceed from there. And oftentimes, those letters accusing a client of trademark infringement can be dealt with in a manner that allows our clients to continue to use their trademark. Um, if you have a trademark that's registered, and uh, you do, I do tell my clients, uh, let me know if you suspect anyone of infringing your trademark. And from time to time, they do that. And uh, if you have a registered trademark, and here's, here's a good reason to register your trademark, uh, because it affords you with more, a lot more remedies than an, uh, an unregistered trademark or a common law trademark. Uh, first of all, it allows you access to federal courts. Second of all, a, a federally registered trademark allows you to enforce your trademark in all 50 states, even if you're only using it, say, in the Midwest. Uh, if you're using your trademark in the Midwest and you have a federal registration and somebody in the Northwest is uh, using a confusingly similar trademark, you can stop them from doing so. Oh, I should interject here that to get a federal registration, you have to be using your mark in interstate commerce. So that's either commerce, that's commerce that affects more than one state. It's a pretty low threshold uh, to, uh, uh, to achieve. Maybe you, even, maybe you only sell through retail stores in one state, but if you have an online presence, we can often justify a federal registration that way. Getting back to uh, remedies in addition to access to federal courts and, uh, and uh, uh, enforcement throughout all 50 United States, uh, a federal registration uh, often entitles you to, if you uh, prevail in a trademark infringement lawsuit, often entitles you to the defendant's profits, uh, additional statutory damages, which are not available through common law registration. In rare cases, triple damages if the infringer, if the bad guy was aware of your registered mark and continued to use their mark anyway. And uh, I think I mentioned earlier on in this uh, that uh, a federally registered trademark uh, gives you the ability to uh, uh, prevent the importation of goods with your trademark on them that are, have not been authorized by you. So that's a, a I believe that's a, a roundup of trademark law, and I'll let John tell you about uh, copyright law. So uh, just to hit on this again, the patents and trademarks are uh, generally going to be the examined rights when you get to the federal level. Uh, copyrights exist. Uh, you have that right as soon as you fix it into a tangible medium. So you can't just sing a song in your office and uh, claim a copyright on that. Once you record it, uh, then that could then be a fixed into a tangible medium. Um, but what's not covered would be facts, ideas, methods of operations. Those are going to have other ways. So facts, I think you're generally not going to be able to get much intellectual property protection on a fact. Um, but the various different ideas and methods of operations are going to be either trade secrets or um, patent registration. Uh, once you do register with the uh, Copyright Office uh, for a small fee, uh, you uh, then can label your work with the, the registered C copyright. And that is um, allows you to bring um, federal actions against somebody if they are infringing on your copyright. Um, so when you, so you, you have a creative work that you've created 
um, how far does that go? So I think um, recently, like the, the James Bond character, if uh, somebody creates that character and writes a movie, a book and produces a movie about them, well, who, who can make a sequel to a James Bond movie? Um, I think there's been at least one or two sequels to a James Bond movie. Uh, and so, but you get into a lot of the fan fictions where they take the, these characters and move them to a different world. And that gets into a lot murkier uh, rights of what is a derivative work? What, uh, what are you actually, how transformative are you doing? Um, but uh, just like the patents though, uh, there is a limited period of time that they do go into the public domain. Um, but one of the conspiracy theories that is going around is that every time the Disney patents are about to expire, the, uh, on Steamboat Willie, the trademark laws magically get extended to keep uh, Disney able to make royalties on all of their Mickey Mouse products. Um, so um, the trivia question that we had was a famous work of art that just went into the public domain. Uh, it was created over 95 years ago. Uh, so you do get a long period of protection to uh, get royalties off of your works. Uh, but one big difference, I think, between copyrights and uh, patents uh, is the role of independent creation. Uh, so with a patent, you have carte blanche uh, a monopoly over anybody practicing that invention, even if they came up with it completely by themselves uh, and had no clue as to what you were doing, which is the importance of the first to file date. But with a copyright, if somebody's never heard your music before and they make a, a series of chords and they go in a certain way um, and they do that completely independently from your song. And even if they sound the exact same when you play them back, uh, they have just as right, uh, they, they have an exception to your copyright rights because they independently created it. So moving on to trade secrets. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, this is just information that isn't accessible to other people that has value by way of it not being accessible. So there's a lot of times where you might not want to get a patent because you have to disclose everything in order to get the patent up front. Uh, and so some of the things that you might want to consider is a 20 year patent term going to be long enough to protect your trade secret. and. Um, a lot of that comes to, um, well, once your product is out in the market, is somebody smart enough to look at it and um, figure out how to do it and maybe even design around it and still get a lot of the same effects, it would just not do it exactly the same as you. Um, even if you do have a patent on it, uh, so it's on how your uh, camera cell phone processes images and you get a certain result from the image processing. Well. If somebody else sells a phone that has the same output, but your patent is on the method of how they get that output, are you even able to uh, detect their infringement? Are you going to have access to their, their computer chips and the source code that tells you how the phone is doing uh, their invention? If the answer is no uh, and you can't detect their infringement, you might as well not have a patent on that. Um, and then is your invention likely to be independently discovered. So if somebody else, if you're racing for a coronavirus vaccine and you know everybody else is gonna be coming up with the same exact vaccine coming up, um, you might want to get a patent on that um, invention. Maybe the vaccine might not be the best example, but if you know everybody's working in the industry is working towards one goal, a patent might be your only um, way to protect that if some people are gonna come up with your way uh, as long as they try hard enough at it. And then finally, uh, the budget. While uh, it may cost uh, several thousand dollars to get a patent application from the preparation to the filing and the examination fees and then the maintenance, um, those are a lot of upfront fees to get a patent, but the, there is no formal fees associated with getting a um, trade secret. But you do have to do a lot to protect your secrets. And we'll get into that in a second. But I do have a couple more examples of what uh, you might want to keep as a trade secret rather than get a sample, like a recipes. Uh, KFC's blend of 11 herbs and spices is a trade secret. Uh, nobody really knows what all those 11 herbs and spices are that other than that there's 11 of them and they're herbs and spices. And if you uh, 
have spare time, you can go check out Twitter's, uh, our KFC's Twitter account, and you can see that they are following only 11 people. Five of them are Spice Girls, and, all, and the other six people are named Herb. So uh, it, kudos to that person for uh, having a little fun marketing tip with their trade secret. But also Google search algorithm. That's something that you can't really detect. You don't really know what's going on in Google's backyard, so they don't necessarily want to file a patent saying this is how we produce our search results. They just do that and keep it under lock and key. And then you also might have client lists um, that is valuable because uh, if you sell copy paper and you have a competitor that sells copy paper, he might just try to undercut all your clients that uh, you have. So you don't, might not want to be advertising who your clients are on your website. You might want to do a little bit more and have protections to keep that list secret. So um, as trade seekers are generally going to be state law, uh, some general guidance do apply towards all. Make sure you keep your information classified, control the access. And uh, one of my big things from the Navy was a uh, need to know with our security clearances. If, uh, even though I had a top secret security clearance, if I didn't need to know that information, I wasn't able to have access to that information. Um, so uh, for your client list, does your um, does one of your engineers necessarily need to know your whole client list? Probably not, but maybe your sales and invoicing people do need to know your client list. So having uh, procedures and protocols in place that keeps um, those um, information secret. You can also have some documents. Um, it for your employment and make people know that these are our trade secrets. So you don't necessarily need to spell them out, but you can give the broad categories of our client, our, our trade secrets include our client list, our recipes for these items, and give the examples and expectations that they will keep them secret, uh, keep records of all of these employment agreements. Uh, also records of what you actually have that are secrets. Um, and you could also do uh, training, periodic training to keep, make sure your employees know what is secret and isn't and uh, to exit interviews. And non-disclosure agreements can come into that, but those are uh, operate together with trade secrets um, and other common law aspects of right to work. So those are other things that you can do to keep your trade secrets secret. Um, while I did say a lot of it is, um, State law based, uh, there has been some recent federal laws. Uh, the Economic Espionage Act uh, provided for criminal um, pro prosecution for international uh, misappropriation of trade secrets. And the Defense Against Trade Secrets Act opened up civil liability for misappropriation of trade secrets across uh, state lines. Um, and it, it, Wisconsin did sign in to the Defense of Trade Secrets Act, so a lot of its protections mirror the trade secret protections of the 48 total states that have signed on to that. But there are some variations throughout. But um, again, there are remedies available um, if somebody is. So uh, it's good to keep your trade secrets protected so that way um, if somebody is misappropriating them, you can get some relief on the back side. Uh, Jack, anything to add before we move into the um, overview of the uh, law changes? No, I think we have, uh, what, about seven minutes to go, John? So go ahead. I'm gonna roll through these pretty quick, but um, the America Invents Act uh, is a little bit older, but it implement was implemented over a period of years. The biggest things are we are now first to file and post-grant proceedings were instituted, which means after you get your patent, there can be extra challenges at the patent office to your patent rights. Um, those are going through the Supreme Court right now, um, and a lot of it has been resolved, but there still are some open questions. And with patent law, the Supreme Court is weighing in on what you can get a patent on. This, uh, the most famous and most pronounced decision was the Alice decision. And, while patent law says what you can get a patent on, the Supreme Court came in and said, well, you also can't get a patent on these other things. And what those other things are and what they mean and how it affects your patent prosecution is evolving as we speak. Uh, here's a short list of the five cases that intellectual property cases that the Supreme Court took up in 2020. So it is an active area of law. Um, 
And then regarding the 101 area, what you can get a patent on at the bottom, uh, we don't expect any more Supreme Court rulings like Alice in the near future, but the federal circuit is continuing to come out with new guidance that conforms with the uh, Alice decision. Um, and this is uh, causing talk of bipartisan legislation that would more affirmatively say what you can get a patent on and maybe even overrule the Alice decision. Uh, but yeah, patents uh, and these are all just proposed legislations, no clear indication that um, these are going to be mo moving through the Congress. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, change going on in our Congress right now. So who knows where intellectual property is falling. Uh, prior to coronavirus, uh, these were some hot topics to get uh, inventor-owned patent protections, and that is to address trolling of patents, uh, establishing a small claims dispute for copyright infringement. Um, so that way you don't have to do full federal litigation for a small copyright claim. Um, to allow designs, customs to seize uh, design patent infringements. Bef Be Jack mentioned trademark infringements. You can stop those coming into the border. Or if you have a design patent on how something looks, you can try to get it. That's, these are all, again, just proposed legislation. And the final one would be um, making it easier to get rid of false use claims. So if I have a mark, I've registered it for six classifications, but I'm only practicing at one. It makes it easier to get rid of the five other classifications to open up that mark for use in other areas. And so we'll move on. Jack, did we happen to get an answer in the chat on our trivia? No, we did not. Am, uh, I, am I eligible? You are not, Jack. But so we do have some clues of who made this famous uh, painting from 1924. She's a Madison, um, grew up in Madison. She recently passed away in 1986, and despite her name, she never lived in Georgia. And she was the second of the seven O'Keefe children. Okay. I so, think it's too early in the morning for everybody, John. <laughs> so this was a Georgia O'Keeffe painting. Her um, painting went into the public domain as of 2020 with her 95 year copyright ex expiring. Um, and so I put this up there because I'm free to reproduce it. So um, I think we do have a couple minutes left over. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, we can open up the chat or just knock off a minute or two early. Okay, uh, we, did have, we did have a question about patent costs, John. And uh, and I indicated I I don't I, I guess it's on everyone's screen, but I indicated that it depends on the technology. It varies quite a bit, uh, but figure between four thousand and twelve thousand to file and prosecute a patent application. That's a decent recommend. Uh, and but the patent prosecution can go as long as you want to keep fighting. Uh, a good attorney will let you know when to throw the towel in. Um, but you could keep going with another 2,000, 3,000 round of prosecution until you, you're not, until you run out of money if you want to. But um, after one or two rounds, it's, you probably know which way it's going to go one way or the other. Well, John, I'll thank you for your presentation. I learned a couple of things myself, so thanks. Okay, well, thank you all. And if you do have any questions about protecting your intellectual property rights, uh, feel free to reach out either to John Iden, he can get you on over to us, or um, directly to us, either way. Well, thank, thank you, gentlemen. You. It, was, uh, it was a pleasure, and uh, it was a good review for me. My background is marketing, and I uh, did not, didn't, I haven't had to deal with uh, needing to put that on specification sheets and when to put a TM versus an R for several years now. So, um, I'm glad to hear that some things have not changed. They've stayed very consistent from that perspective. So thank you very much for your time. And unless we have any other questions out there, and I don't believe we do, um, checking the chat right now, uh, wishing you all a very wonderful holiday season. Thanks much. Signing off now. <laughs>